Jesus says here there are only two ways to live. The way of the crucifiers or of the Christ, the crucified. Do please take a seat. Let me just quickly say before I pray that it has been a great joy and a real privilege to serve alongside so many of you in ministry and um, the church staff as well and a great joy week by week to work with so many of the students that come along here. So thank you so much for making that possible over the last three years. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the bits that we have read from it tonight. And Lord, we pray that your spirit would work in us and help us to understand it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure most of us would agree that somewhere inside and to some, of, some degree in each of us there is a competitive streak. That's the human race. We see it constantly in workplaces. We see it even in our friendships where qualities are equal. There's a race for the top spot and figuring out who has it. I have a couple of friends and when we play games, as we do every so often when we get together, I know exactly what buttons to press to manipulate their competitive streak. Not that I would do that. <laughs> My wife is the opposite to this. She is the exception. She loves pretty much any game or sport, but hates that there has to be a winner. She just wants everyone to have fun and enjoy it, and I just do not get that. So we aren't ever in the same team. Why do it if you can't win? I love to boo and taunt and play mind games and win. <laughs> now we see that same approach in the news often too. Much of what we watch or read about is about someone getting to number one. We've seen that in the last seven weeks of, as we've watched that unfold in a rather undignified way amongst our politicians in the general election. We hear it all the time, and many of us might have even said this to somebody, you need to look out for number one. We're in competition with one another for the top spot. And when we get together in school or at work, or in a seminar or with friends, there's almost like a clash of the gods because we each want to be number one. We hate to be outdone. Whether that's behind the wheel when someone slips out in front of us, whether it's in a queue, or dare I say, even in church. Often we can fall into the trap of wanting our voice to be heard louder than the rest, that we want more clout, more influence than the next person. It is true of the world, and sadly it is also true of many Christians as we live together in the church. Faith in Christ should free us to live against the cultural grain, but it does creep in. Whether it's in the virtuosity of our prayers or just our public life or our preaching, we can turn our Christian lives into baptised glory hunting in the church and everywhere else that we go to. And that's what's going on in this passage tonight with James and John. If you haven't done so already, it would be great if you could find that again, that passage from Mark's Gospel that was read to us earlier. It's on page 846 in the Bibles and there is some space in the back of your notice or your service sheet sorry if you want to use that to jot down any notes it's the way of our world you see and it always has been it was just the same when Jesus came into the world so there's not so much difference in this circumstance between first century Israel and 21st century Britain so none of us need a degree in theology tonight to get this attitude or a great deal of understanding of the first century world even no as Ian prayed for us just a minute ago. What we need are ears that are ready to hear and hearts that are open to change. Hearts that are ready to heed the challenge that Jesus will set before us. Because it is our hearts that are under attack in this passage. Look down at verse 31. But many who are first will be last and the last first. That is to say... I have come to turn your human ideas of greatness upside down. 
Don't follow me if you want to be great. That is not the package that I am offering to you, my disciples. I guess you could say that verse 36 focuses today's issues so well. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus? Asked them. What are your expectations of following me? What is the package that you're after? That's not really an unimportant question. It's quite normal. We ask that in so many walks of life, don't we? What's the deal here? What am I going to get in return? What's the package? If you're not a Christian here tonight, then it might seem like a pretty important question. You might not be sure if you're a Christian and asking that very question at the moment. You want to get a handle on what this package offered by Jesus is. You want that clear in your mind before you jump in and find that actually it's all just a bit too much. It's not quite what you bargained for. If you're one of our young people, you might be listening and thinking, what kind of life is Jesus offering compared to the kind of life that my friends are living? Even if you're a Christian here tonight, this question is important because it's one that we can so easily get wrong. And that's what we see. Mark shows us the dullness of James and John to point out just how easy it is for the disciples, that's you and me, to get this wrong. The first last and the last first. So let's jump in. So my first heading for tonight is, what is the way of Christ? Now it's a bit sneaky really because it takes us back a couple of verses before our passage. Jesus told and then showed his disciples then and now that it is suffering that is the way of Christ. So look down just a little bit before what was read to us at verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus, with Je and Jesus walking ahead of them. And they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was, hap what was to happen to him, saying... See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. Jesus has told his disciples these things before. He has come, yes, as the Messiah, but not in glory. Not as an earthly king or a ruler, no. And that is what the disciples expected. Jesus tells them here quite plainly that he came to die. He's the suffering servant. Notice that in verse 32, Jesus is walking ahead of his disciples. He is leading them right into the face of his own death deliberately. He explains, we're going to Jerusalem for me to be killed in a disgraceful death. For me to be utterly rejected by the leaders of God's people. But I will rise again. That's probably not the package that his disciples thought would be offered to them in following him. Back in 2011, I was working as a teacher in the southeast of England and it got to Christmas and I was to fly home to be with my family in Northern Ireland. Now this particular Christmas I got a colleague to drop me off at Stansted Airport. That was to save me the cost of two weeks car parking. It was the first time that I did this and it was the last. I was dropped off with a case full of gifts and a backpack probably full of work that I wasn't going to mark but would take home anyway. And I was going, to go, I was going home after a long and tough term which included an inspection at school. As I walked into the airport I glanced up at the screens just as my flight went from on time to cancelled. I was probably two hours at least from my flat by public transport. My colleague was gone and I was stranded without his number. I joined the queue at the EasyJet, EasyJet desk, which was approximately 193 miles long, of course, <laughs> only to find that about two hours after I joined the queue that the earliest flight that they could get me onto was the 26th of December. So I would miss Christmas at home. No way, so I got a flight to Glasgow that night which conveniently a friend was having a party in Glasgow, so I went along to that. And I managed to get a book, or I managed to book a spot on a ceiling from Cairn Ryan to Belfast. So eventually was able to jump on a train and made the boat. I got home to find that the road from Belfast to Bangor, where my parents live, was shut because of snow. 
and my family couldn't get to Belfast to pick me up. I got into a taxi to get the driver to take me to a nearby hotel, but he assured me that he could get me to Bangor. <laughs> but he couldn't. Six miles out, there was 40 pounds on the meter. It was 11 o'clock at night, and he tells me that that's as far as he's going to go. And I had a choice of going back to Belfast with him, doubling that 40 pounds probably, or getting out there. So I jump out with case, rucksack, and begin walking the six miles to town. Two police cars passed and a snowplow, and I'm still walking because none of them stopped. Several hours later, I get home, having walked through snow up my shins. I was two days late getting home. I set out intending for success. So sure that the path that lay before me was so simple and I would get home for Christmas. I set out for success but found disaster after disaster after disaster. The journey was a failure. So much so that it's easy to look back now and laugh at it. I can glory in that failure. And this is the total opposite of what Jesus is saying here. He deliberately chose utter failure. Nothing about it is funny and nothing about it. There's nothing there in which to be gloried for the disciples. We can miss that, you see. We are so used to the cross on which Jesus died. It's such a part of our cultural wallpaper for so many of us that we can miss that. We can miss what Jesus is saying. Suffering was the way for Christ on earth. But not only that, but the rest of the passage makes it clear that it is the way for those of us who follow him. So on to the next point. What is the way for Christians? If Christ suffered and we followed him, then we too should expect that suffering is the way for us. Jesus said that himself in John 15. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And that is the burden we see here. James and John here replace the usual scene of Peter being the disciple closest to Jesus and getting things wrong. They step up and they come to Jesus in verse 35. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Isn't that incredible? Despite the title they give to Jesus here, they seem to have realised that he can answer prayers. But they see him a bit like a genie who, if they rub, it, rub him the, the right way, he will give them what they want. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus says. Knowing what is coming, but allowing them to go on so to teach them and us tonight a lesson. And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. These brothers might have understood that there was suffering on the cards, but they seemed to think that glory was just around the corner. Perhaps they'd got stuck on the promise of the resurrection and just kind of not listened to all the stuff that was going to come before that. Maybe these brothers are fixated on the glory that they witnessed at the transfiguration, just a chapter earlier we don't know how they've come to this point but we know that glory and greatness are important to each of them there's no doubting that at all they're mixed up James and John seem to realize that they are tied to Jesus as it were that they are with him but they still have their own agenda to be with him in glory and Jesus goes on and says to them down in verse 38 you do not know what you're asking. You're really confused. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And now that's, that's referring back to the Old Testament language where God would pour out his judgment against human sin. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptised with the baptism with which I am baptised? He's saying, can you go to the cross? You want my glory. You want the glory. But can you take the suffering first? James and John aren't going to be put down too easily and they say, we are evil. This is incredible. Jesus doesn't come down on them in a rage. No, he simply tells them that they will suffer and that glory is not for him to grant. Look down midway through verse 39. 
Jesus said, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptised, you will be baptised. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it, is, it has been prepared. When Jesus says that they will drink the same cup, he's not saying that they are going to bear God's wrath in the same way that he does on the cross. No, he's using picture language to say that, that they will suffer for his sake and in a similar way to him. That is, they would suffer because of their faith in Jesus. That is the package he is offering them. He swiftly adds that glory is not for him to grant. It's not on the agenda here. It's not up for grabs right now. He says you need to refocus. You better get ready to suffer. There's a sense here that he's saying following me is like a funeral for your desires, your aims, and your hope. The hope that you have of being God yourself. A funeral for your agenda. The desire to be number one and to be great in the world. Jesus has already told his disciples in chapter 8 verse 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. James and John need to call this to mind. They'd heard it already, but they hadn't taken it in. They needed to hear it again and learn it and live it properly. How foolish of them, we might say. But surely we are kidding ourselves to call them foolish. How foolish of so many of us how many of us need to hear that lesson again for ourselves tonight? We are called to put our priorities, our aims, and our desire to be number one to death and to follow Jesus. What is that going to mean for you? What are you currently chasing after and putting ahead of following him? What are your priorities? This takes us to the last part of tonight's passage, Sue. So my third heading is this. Service is the way to suffer. The final part is looking at what all of this means and why. And we're going to find that service is the way to suffer. You might be thinking to yourself, well, this really sounds like the sort of gift or the sort of package that I could do without why must the Christian's pattern of life be the same as Christ's? Why must I walk in the shadow of the cross? And the answer lies in the contrast that Jesus draws in this final section between two ways to live. So look down at verse 41. We see that the rest of the disciples are totally outraged by James and John's request here. But don't be fooled. This shows us that the, that the ten of them were just as concerned about their own glory as James and John. They were angry because the brothers had got in there first. We don't resent people getting ahead of us unless we're in competition with them. So he calls them all together and speaks to them again about the Gentiles and the way that they see life. He speaks to them about the way of the world, which is summed up in that little phrase, lords it over them. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, Jesus says, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Isn't that something which we've all experienced? Something that comes naturally to most of us when we get to the top. We need to actively resist the temptation to lord it over those who are under us. And when we aren't on top, how easily we resent those who are. And we want it for ourselves. But not so with you, Jesus says. Verse 43. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you 
must be slave of all. That's the pattern that we are called to. Put everyone else before yourself. Because that's exactly what our Saviour did for us on the cross. Christ hung and died because he put us before himself. Now in some ways I can feel myself almost blushing here because I can think of the many occasions this week that I've put myself before others. I know there'll be people sitting in here tonight who have witnessed that and could tell you just how I have done it. This is no doubt a challenge for all of us. Jesus says here there are only two ways to live. The way of the crucifiers or of the Christ, the crucified. Jesus suffered to serve others and he calls you and me to go against our natural instincts and the cultural tide and do just the same. It all sounds very noble and stirring, but the question is, how is it going to change the practice in my life and in your life? What is going to change as a result of walking out those doors at the end of this service? Because we cannot walk in the way of the cross theoretically. If you're not a Christian here tonight, how are you going to walk after hearing this passage? You may not have decided and think that the way of the world is actually not so bad and that you're quite all right with it. But I'd encourage you to reflect and think, are you really all right with it? Do you not become sickened by the way that we treat each other in the race to the top? Like I said at the start, our main parties have so sadly illustrated this so perfectly for us in the last number of weeks as they have slung mud at each other. Do you really think that it is the best way to live, to live for ourselves? Look back over the last week, year or decade. I'm sure like me, you will recall moments where you have lived for yourself and that brings shame to mind and a fear of being found out. Well, Christ offers a fresh start and that's what we see in verse 45 jesus came not to be served but to serve the son of god the king of all creation came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many he came to pay for our sin to take the punishment for our wrongdoing to suffer on our behalf for our rebellion against our creator and offer us a fresh start. If you're not a Christian, you may want to pick up one of these booklets, Why Jesus on the Way Out, which might explain to you a little bit more about Jesus and the, um, what it means to follow him. They're, they're free for you in the racks by the doors. But what about those of us who are believers here tonight? We actually have the most in common with James and John tonight because we believe and follow Jesus just like they did. And I suspect that a lot of us have a lot in common with this encounter too. Where are you pushing to be first in life? Is it in the small things like hating that car slipping out ahead of you or not waiting to be let out yourself but pushing on? Is it not being able to lose in a game or a conversation or an argument? Is it having to be the focus of attention? Is it treating every person around you as if that's exactly what they are around you, orbiting you? Or is it missing opportunities to serve others, to put yourself last and others first? What is it for you? I suspect that we could make quite a long list as each of us reflects. A call to follow Christ is a call to put our priorities and aims second and follow in his path. The call of Christ is to serve and suffer 
in the way of the cross. And it's not a call that we can follow without obedience. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son into the world, not to be served, but to serve. We thank you so much that you sent him to give his life as a ransom for us. That through him, we are rescued from the punishment which we deserve. Father, by your spirit, help each one of us to understand that afresh tonight. And to live more wholeheartedly for you as a result. In Jesus' name, amen.